Freaking get away from him. He's like stuck there. He can't do anything. The fuck? This is so creepy. This is so creepy. You know I can't get these a case right now. No. No, don't leave. No, don't separate. My hands are sweating already. Me too. Jordan Peele, get out. This is the first Oscar for three times. Jordan Peele's debut directorial effort and Tour de Force Get Out was culturally groundbreaking. The horror thriller made waves in a way that no one could see coming. A fresh take on the guess who's coming to dinner trope was a hit with audiences. We'll explore some of the imagery, meaning, and symbolism that made the film such a success. Looking at the inspiration for the film and the way that it uses black exploitation as a lens to craft one of the most successful horrors of all time. So, let's dive right in. Get Out is partly inspired by the 1967 classic, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which is the story of a black man played by Sidney Poitier, who's invited to be a guest in the home of the White Drayton family by their daughter Joanna, who he plans to marry. The liberal-minded parents find themselves in discomfort at the idea of an interracial marriage, despite their political leanings. Using a similar setup, Get Out has a rom-com-like introduction which it continues to use throughout the film to explore the racial tensions and the main character's interracial relationship in the face of bigotry, one that mirrors Peel's childhood and adult experience. This whole thing about a post-race society, it's like, well, how is that even possible when these stories haven't been told? But you think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. Do they know I'm black? No. Should they? <laughs> you lying bitch. She is lying like a motherfucker. I know that. Ooh, that the well meaning liberal also comes into question early in both films that despite general intentions being good, deep seated cultural divides being sometimes insurmountable. I think it's fair to say that this uneasiness in Get Out foreshadows the importance of skin color in people's perspective as the objectification of human beings. John Prentice in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is an accomplished physician and more importantly has an upstanding character, but his skin color is what creates reservations. Was explained to me by my daughter that she intended to get married and that her intended was a young man whom I had never met who happened to be a Negro. Well, let me tell you something. You may think you're fooling Miss Joy and her folks, but you ain't fooling me for a minute. You think I don't see what you are? You're one of those smooth-talking, smart-ass niggas just out for all you can get with your black... The subtle objectification is further examined in its horror-like elements in Get Out, where the motivations are much more heinous. But before we get there, another very obvious inspiration to the film that I want to go over is The Stepford Wives. This film is definitely a contributing factor to the uncanny valley nature of the film. I'll just die if I don't get this recipe. Oh, Regina, I'm so sorry. Many complain about how much is borrowed from the Stepford Wives, but it's not a surprise when considering how much influence the author Ira Levin had over Peel's work. Ira Levin, the acclaimed author, was an inspiration that Peel used to set the story's uneasy atmosphere. However, the more sinister and perhaps subtle inspiration is the one that I'll be using to break down this film. The inspiration is none other than another 1967 classic, also authored by Ira Levin, Rosemary's Baby. Horror films uh, influence you especially? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the big ones were Rosemary's Baby and, and uh, The Stepford Wives. Um, among among others, but you know those those, those were uh, stories written by Ira Levin, who is a you know really brilliant novelist and and um, has written many screenplays and and his technique of inching us towards this in, in, inevitable horrific reveal, um, but not moving so fast that you don't understand why the lead character is staying in the scene. Those of you who are unfamiliar with Rosemary's Baby, this was a seminal work in the horror genre. 
Directed by the now shamed auteur Roman Polanski, it was one of the earliest films to adopt satanic imagery in what could be described as the new Hollywood horror. Moving away from a world of monsters that lurk in castles such as Dracula and Frankenstein, and into the domestic world of a dingy New York City apartment, horror had finally made its way into the homes of the American public. Groundbreaking not only in the change in setting, the subject matter was also regarded as foundational for kickstarting satanic depictions in film. Polanski hired the leader of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, to advise him on the actual rituals and practices that they might be captured in their full on screen. This movie was monumental in the popularization of the movement, not only through the horror genre, but an actual practice as well. We see depictions in media up to today's significant entries in the horror landscape, such as Ari Aster's Hereditary and Robert Eggers' The Witch. These films trace their lineage to Rosemary's Baby, and albeit an unlikely successor, Get Out remains one of the best to incorporate its elements. The recent resurgence of horror from the perspective of these artists who draw their roots from this film also speaks to the influence and continued interest around the topics that we'll break down further. Rosemary's Baby was an important one, and I feel like people who see the film, it's, you know, it's, it's in the text, it's very clear how the films are aligned. Polanski is just somebody that I've been studying for a long time. The way that he blocks his actors and then the way that he moves his camera in, in relation to that blocking is really beautiful and really intricate and everything is invisible that he's doing. Um, everything is like designed to be hidden. And so many lines that feel like they're talking about one thing, but they could be talking about something else, mm -hmm. but you don't know if it's being hidden or not. Yeah. Yeah. I meant that. That's what I meant when I did that. Starting with the obvious reference to the film, the character named Rose, is named after the titular character of the Polanski flick, Rosemary. Rose and Get Out underhandedly tricks members of the black community in order to use their bodies for experimentation. Another callback to the predecessor is the character Roman Armitage, who could be a reference to Polanski, but is more likely a nod to Roman Castavet, another character from the film. Let's take a look at some of the more sinister comparisons in the movie. See, Ira Levin is a master of the unsettling, and he crafts his stories in a way that the protagonist's feeling of unease could be a myriad of things particularly with them being a fish out of water. However, the malevolent intentions are thinly masked to the audience, who question everything right along with the main character, yet are lacking enough evidence to scream at them to run for dear life. What Ira Levin did with Rosemary's Baby and the Stepford Wives is he wove these, these very social thrillers, and uh, he built them so subtly that the main character couldn't quite tell if something really dark and horrendous was happening, or if this was just garden variety, um, average uh, social weirdness. And that's what kept, keeps them in the character. For Rosemary's Baby, the protagonist suffers from the cruel objectification of her husband and the cast of vets. She's offered a cup to contain sedatives to drug her and support her unwilling copulation with a demonic entity. Similarly, it is a cup of tea that sends Get Out's Chris into the underworld, the world of mind control, using his trauma as a way into his soul. His terror is palpable, it's one of the most memed scenes in Pills filmography, his mouth agape, eyes filled with horror. Rosemary is used for her body to house a demonic entity. Chris's body is used to house demonic intention. The lack of consent to what occurs to both characters is telling of what an objectified and materialistic world does to its innocents, who are there to be used and discarded. It didn't die, you took it! You lied! You witches! Rosemary's Baby, unlike some of the many horrors since its release in 1967, showed that flying chairs and tables isn't where the real horror is. It's in the details, the inklings of a different reality, a subtle disorder. The occult ritual and get-out are critiquing a materialist worldview. The Armitage family is carrying out their deeds in the name of transhumanist ideals. Transhumanism is the belief that humanity can be made something more than itself, through the use of technology. Greater intellect, physiology, all possible through breakthroughs in the tech space. Think cyborgs, the six million dollar man, Neuralink as a recent example. The purpose is to become gods on earth. To restore full body functionality. To on at least four. With immortal, unaging bodies. Limitless potential only bound by human imagination. Transhumanism is rooted in the idea that human beings are just their material makeup. Our minds and bodies can be reduced to their component parts, and these components can be enhanced. However, the spiritual dimension, which includes the human dimension, is entirely obsoleted in this worldview. Cool. 
Agala procedure is a man-made miracle. We're born, we breathe, and we die. The blind art dealer who admires Chris's eye for detail in his photography describes his work as brutal and melancholic. You've got something. The images you capture so brutal, so melancholic. It's powerful stuff, I think. But it's exactly this experience that's lost. Not only are the Armitage, but the Illuminati-like cabal that they cater to. You know, I can give a shit what, what color you are. No. What I want is deeper. I want your eye, man. See, they fantasize of acquiring the black experience without any of its pain. I find that the African-American experience for me has been, for the most part, very good. Although I find it difficult to go into detail as I haven't had much. It's this experience and its segregating nature in the American context that creates a sort of uncomfortable situation that is the garden party. It's not because they're robots or not human, but because they don't see Chris as anything more than a tool for their desires. Not bad. Hey, Nielsen. Ah. So, is it true? Is it better? Well, well. And I'm like green. Chris, nice to, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Chris. Nice to meet you indeed. Oh, and that's quite a grip. Well, thank you, you too, man. You, uh, you ever play golf? Fair skin has been in favor for the past, what, couple of hundreds of years. But now the pendulum is swung back. Black is in fashion. And as Chris finds himself the center of attention at this figure to slave auction, there are no instances of solace. It's entirely his outward appearance that the guests are fixated on. This is a testament to the materialism that is the bedrock to their beliefs. It turns out people up here are just as messed up in the head as they are in the city. American idealism was crafted in a time where a human being could be reduced to more intelligent and capable livestock, to be used for the means of acquiring material wealth. In a world that forces one to be objectified, it must reconcile the exploitation of human capital. That focus allows them to compartmentalize the brutal nature of the work they're doing in order to become whole. Just like the Nazis mentioned at the start of the film. Always one in front of him. Yeah, what a moment, what a moment. I mean, Hitler's up there with all this perfect Aryan race bullshit. This black dude comes along, proves him wrong in front of the entire world. That the limitation of the human being is completely material is just a branch of that thinking that there is a way to escape these limitations through technology, which will establish humanity as gods on earth, is their understanding. We'll die someday, but we are divine. We are the gods trapped in cocoons. Rose. Rather, this line of thinking is looking for heaven on earth, which is exactly what a deal with the devil is, especially when it necessitates harming others for that gain. The elder Armitage patriarch who lost to Jesse Owens in the Olympics lives out his fantasy in the dead of the night, running around the fields in a way to relive what might have been had his mind just been in the right body. In the world of athletics, to strip the individuals involved to merely physical attributes is par for the course in both the racial sense and the history of exploitation. Coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. We'll be right back. Are some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never call me nigger. You had a hundred thousand people who were prepared to do what Muhammad Ali just did. You would bring this war to a stop. Understanding nothing of the symbolic weight that Jesse Owens in a Nazi Germany carried is a testament to their adoration of the material. Amazing. Tough break for your dad though. Yeah. You almost got over it. Couple that with the foreshadowing in the introduction of this scene where Rose's father mentions the eugenic experimentation of the Nazis to further spell the roots of their intentions. Where they differ is through the exploitation of what they consider as a pinnacle of the human specimen. White black people. <laughs> Who knows? People want to change. Some people want to be stronger, faster, cooler. And unlike the Nazis who upheld that the Ubermensch was inherently white, this pinnacle instead was the merge of white minds and black bodies. Now, what are you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, dad's black, mom's white. Standard issue, pretty much. Powerful, powerful combination genetic wise, right? You get the body of the black man and then you get the mind of the white man all right. together in some yeah. strange combination. The film explores how the black body is fetishized by the guests, 
depictions of which are often seen in black exploitation or slavery films, where slaves are used for entertainment, either for pure lust or for bloodlust. These depictions of objectified human beings whose sole purpose is for the gain of another are empowered by a materialist worldview. This helps to further the transhuman agenda of the Armitage family. Behold, the Coagula. The symbol of the Armitage family is none other than Rose. Once perceived as welcoming, empathetic, loyal, the 180 of her character is really chilling. She can't be involved, can she? She's not coming across like she's involved. Is she in on this? She cannot be. <gasps> she's part of it. This is so f***ed up. Rose is possibly the most objectified character in the film next to Chris. She is the honey trap that the family uses to produce their ill-gotten gains. With a list of victims as deep as the family's history of this practice, her true side is shown to be mechanical, calculating, and dispassionate, almost like an automaton. This is incredibly sad when considering she is a symbol of unchecked materialism, who simply goes through the motions of feigned compassion and love for the victims as part of her ruse. Insects caught in a spider's web. That's what makes the satanic element in this film subtle. It requires working backwards to the foundation of the American experience. It's not really that strange considering what it takes. The proverbial deal with the devil means sacrificing an afterlife for what is here and now. What's here and now is this physical world and all of its material gain. Despite necessitating that you take the offer from an incorporeal entity, the lust for world to gain has mankind in a chokehold. In Rosemary's Baby, it's the husband who pawns off his unsuspecting wife to their satanic neighbors after they promise him the world, and he begins to experience the slightest of success as an actor. You have a most interesting inequality, guy. It appears in your television work, too. It should take you a long way indeed, provided, of course, that you get those initial breaks. He disregards the potential damage to other invisible or incorporeal realities like the soul of his wife, or even his own. These are the realities that don't exist in the worlds we've created for ourselves, where materialism, and thereby exploitation, is the order of the day. This lack of a unifying human experience is apparent in the eeriness that the only black person at the party feels, because he's looked at as prime real estate for the minds of the guests to inhabit. The other black people that Chris meets in the film only further his alienation, which causes him to question his place in their world before eventually breaking his trust in the family completely. In my previous essay of the Jordan Peele film Nope, I show the use of the camera as a device in which black Americans are finding a way to even out an unjust playing field by capturing the experience of horror where in their prior history these incidents were without witness. Examples of this shift find their start with the tragic murder of Emmett Till whose body was displayed for the world to see and help kickstart the civil rights movement. She said, leave my son's casket open. She said, the world needs to see what they did to my baby. And every publication here in the United States, from Jet Magazine all the way to the New York Times, had this boy's horribly bloated body on its cover. And if our civil rights movement was a car, this boy's dead body was premium gas. This was a very definitive moment in American history where every thinking and feeling person was like, ugh, we gotta do better than this. More recent examples stretch from the Rodney King beating to the high profile cop killings of Eric Gardner, Oscar Grant, and George Floyd, as well as many more. The camera serves a much more subtle element in this film as a stand in for the black experience. The camera even returns the once lost mind of Andre who momentarily shouts a warning to their next victim. The camera symbolizes a tool by which one person's experience is able to meet another's. And this is a key point in the film, where the things that were ignored entirely by the Armitage finally comes home to roost. Chris uses their sense of superiority against them, as the prey who was once caught in the den of lions begins to use their underestimation to his advantage. Symbolically, the prey literally kills the predator as he impales the Armitage patriarch with deer horns. He outwits the Armitage son twice, the first being the use of cotton to block out the sounds of a teacup which would return him to the sunken place, the second time highlighting how both mentally and physically Chris is capable. That doesn't, by mixed. the way, mean that black people don't have brains. It's no. a different brain, don't, right. don't get me wrong. But I'm saying it's clearly black people have the superior body. So the thing about jujitsu is strength doesn't matter, right? It's all about this. 
It's a strategic game, like chess. It's all about being two, three, four moves ahead. The idea that Chris doesn't just outmuscle Jeremy, he outsmarts him at his own game. Finally, the matriarch of the family that uses Chris's trauma to trap him and control his mind. The callback is made to set the symbolic weight of the teacup, with Chris shattering the teacup in their final confrontation as a way to see him breaking the stranglehold of their worldview on him. No longer will he be objectified. Despite the resurfaced traumas of Chris's experience in losing his mother, and that being used against him as a way to exploit him, he still maintains his humanity. The horrors he's witnessed in the Armitage household don't take away the most essential thing, which is the human spirit and compassion in the face of evil. He saved her from the car wreck, despite the fact that she isn't herself anymore. He sees her as a person because of the shared experience and mercy he has for someone who's undergone the same tragedies as befell his mother. He doesn't give in to apathy and even when he's about to murder in cold blood, the source of his cruelest experience, he's brought back to his senses by friendship. Get Out is a story told by Jordan Peele with great mastery and used to explore a variety of interesting philosophies and worldviews. From transhumanism to racial identity, he calls us to consider the consequences of our way of thinking about people and their condition, and how important it is to maintain our humanity in the faces of forces that would prefer we become as calculating as machines. This film was one that resonated with many people across a range of different backgrounds because of these underlying messages and metaphors that seek to reconcile what the world is and what it can be. Not a stepping stone for gaining more than the person next to you, but a way to hold each other up and overcome tragedy. Um, some of y'all are crazy. I, I honestly um, never thought people would pick up on this stuff so fast. I want to thank you all who stay tuned in. I hope you can give me a like, subscribe, and comment if you appreciated anything about this video. Feel free to explore my channel more for other essays or tune in to some of the great music videos that I've made on my channel. If you're so inclined, my Patreon is set up now to help the channel grow. And as always, thank you for watching. What do you do? Nothing. Nothing. I just sat there. You didn't call anyone? No. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that if I did, make it real. <laughs>